Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Varanga Pereira. I'm an assistant professor of instruction in the physics department here at UT Austin. I teach a couple of introductory physics courses that are primarily taken by life science students. So as one of these students who's taking one of these classes, you might wonder, why do I need to study physics? So we're here at the Norman Hackman building on campus. We're gonna look at a really good example of where physics meets the life sciences. So let's go check it out. The Biomedical Imaging Center is in the basement of the Norman Hackman building. Inside, they have a magnetic resonance imaging machine. The MRI machine is one of the best examples connecting physics directly to the life sciences. We'll learn what an MRI machine is and what physics are involved to make it work. This is Dr. Julie DiCarlo, who is an MRI staff scientist here. Julie, so how do you describe an MRI machine very broadly? Well, an MRI machine is used to make images inside the body for diagnostic use or for biomedical research. So something like an X-ray machine can also be used to make images, but that relies on bone absorbing ionizing radiation. MRI has the advantage that it doesn't require ionizing radiation, so the patient doesn't get a dose of radiation with each scan, but also it can make images of different soft tissues. We can get a different contrast between muscle and bone and tissues like fat, and we can see even cartilage on it. We can even use it to measure things like blood flow and to visualize how the blood is flowing into certain tissues. So in terms of the broad physics concepts that go into making an MRI machine work, there's electricity, magnetism, electromagnetic waves, and even some nuclear physics. The great thing is all of these topics are covered in Physics 317L. Maybe we can start with electricity and talk about that component of an MRI machine. So inside the MRI machine, there's a coil and it's taking, it's sending a lot of current through it, right? Yeah, there are actually three types of magnetic fields. The main field is a superconducting magnet made of niobium titanium. It is superconducting at or below temperatures of 9.4 Kelvin. So in order to keep it below 9 Kelvin temperature, we use liquid helium in order to surround the wires. And to keep the helium in liquid form, it's all enclosed in a cryostat, which is basically like a thermos that's very insulated and very strong. That's important to be aware of because the magnetic field from an MRI machine is never off. That main field persists even if there's a power outage to the building. So long as the liquid helium is present and the wires are cold, that current will continue to circulate indefinitely. So this is Ohm's law, V equals IR in action. For a given voltage, if we drop the resistance, the current will go up. And we can see that with this demonstration here, where we have a light bulb that's connected to a battery, but the wire itself is this exposed copper wire. And let's see what happens when you send current through this light bulb. You can see the light bulb turns on, it's fairly dim. But what we could do is use some liquid nitrogen. Okay, so now let's see what happens to the resistance of this coil if we cool it down with liquid nitrogen. So I'm gonna put this coil inside with the liquid nitrogen, and then I'm also gonna now pass the current through this light bulb, and you should see that this light bulb is brighter than it was when the coil was at room temperature. So Julie, how does this compare with the MRI's cooling system? Well, just like your cooling copper wire here, we have copper wire radio frequency coils that can be used to receive the MRI signal. And by cooling those with liquid nitrogen, it would decrease the resistance and improve the signal to noise of the images and improve the image quality. So there's an area of research that uh, is open actually into cooling uh, radio frequency coils. So 
So Julie, we've talked about a coil that's carrying a lot of current, but what does that have to do with magnetism, right? So from Ampere's law, one of Maxwell's four equations, it tells us that if you have a current that's going through, it will generate a magnetic field around it. Even a simple wire carrying some current will have a magnetic field around it. So let's take a look at this demo. We have these wires that are coiled together if this is a solenoid. And what we can do is once we run the current through it, we'll, we can see magnetic field lines that form. So to do that, what I'm gonna do is sprinkle some iron filings. And what you'll see is that once I run a current through this coil, you'll start seeing the magnetic field lines so Julie, how does this compare to the coil in the MRI machine? Biggest difference has to do with that we need a very uniform field or a very homogeneous field. And when we talk about how uniform a field is, we usually describe its variation in parts per million. So how many millions of the main field strength is the variation over the volume inside the coil. And when we talk about building a coil that's uniform enough to image a human body, we need that volume to be 40 to 50 centimeters in diameter. So we talk about having a field that's a part per million over a spherical volume of 40 to 50 centimeters. And to design a coil used for imaging, normally what's done is you might have a solenoid, but the windings might be bunched along the length in certain places. And you could use inductance calculations to simulate the magnetic field throughout as part of the coil design process. So we've talked about this very strong magnetic field produced by the MRI machine. Can we sense it? So here's an aluminum foil ball. It's made of crumpled layers of aluminum foil. It's not ferromagnetic, so it's not gonna be attracted to the magnet, but it is conductive. So let's see what happens when it travels through the magnetic field. So here's our aluminum ball. I'm standing at the end of the table where the magnetic field is lower. So I'm gonna demonstrate that I can throw this ball pretty easily in here. So watch it. But as I move closer to the magnet, something starts to happen as I try moving it around the scanner. It, at, at the entrance to the scanner where there are fringe fields, as I'm moving it, it gets really hard to twist. And if I try to throw it here, it doesn't go very far. And it's not because I'm not trying to throw it. Even if I try to just let it roll off my hand, it does so slowly because there's a force acting on it. Whereas if I come back out here, I have no trouble dropping it, and it's much easier to twist and move around. So what you saw are eddy currents generated in the surface of the ball. So as the ball moves through the magnetic field, the amount of magnetic field lines or the flux that's moving through the surface of the conductor is changing. That induces a voltage across the surface of the conductor, so that's Faraday's law. And that voltage creates currents to circulate in the conductor surface, and those currents, um, eddy currents, are the thing that creates the force that's applied to the ball as it moves through the magnetic field. So we can see this effect of eddy currents with a tube that's metallic. So let's take two objects, one that's not magnetic. You can see that this object isn't magnetic because it doesn't affect this compass here. And I'm gonna have a similar object that is magnetic. It's also metal, but it's magnetic. As it, you can see, it affects the compass. Let's see what happens when we drop the not magnetic metal through it. As you can see, it just falls through. Let's compare that to the magnetic piece. And you'll see that it happens a lot slower. And this is because there are eddy currents being generated within this metallic tube because there's a magnet going through it and that those currents generated are producing a force that counters the force of gravity. So that acts to slow down this piece of metal. Julie, going back to our conversation, now we have a coil that's cooled to a very low temperature. It's carrying a lot of current 
and it's generating a very strong magnetic field and it's very uniform inside the MRI machine. So now the question is, how does that strong magnetic field affect the human body? Well, the human body is made up mostly of water, which is two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. And so it's the protons that help us generate the signal. The magnetic spins of these protons are affected by the magnetic field. So you mentioned spin. Is it analogous to a figure skater or spinning top? Is that what we mean by spin? So it's a quantum mechanical property of subatomic particles. Um, it's a quantum mechanical property that has to do with angular momentum, but the protons aren't actually spinning. So the external field that's part of this MRI machine, that's affecting the hydrogen atoms or the protons. They're being aligned along that same field. Is that what's going on? Yeah, that's right. The protons will have uh, a tendency to align either a parallel or anti-parallel with a slight affinity for aligning parallel to the magnetic field, which creates a net magnetic moment. So we've talked about electricity, magnetism, and we've touched on nuclear physics. The other part is electromagnetic waves, right? So one of the things that results from Maxwell's equations is this idea that accelerating charges lead to electromagnetic waves. Something like light, which is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but also radio waves. So how do radio waves come into this? How do, how do they help the MRI machine work? Oh, radio waves are very important. So there's a second type of magnetic field called B1, that's a radio frequency field, and it's oriented perpendicular to the main field, and it oscillates, so it looks like a field that's rotating around the main field. So we can turn that on for a period of time, and the spins will tip towards that field. When we turn that field off, they will slowly relax back to being aligned with the main field. Now, depending on the density of the tissue and some other properties, they will relax at different rates. For example, um, protons in bone will relax back to the direction of the main field at a different rate than protons in, say, fat or muscle. So by tipping all the spins and then adjusting that the time that we wait until we listen to the signal, we can get images with different contrast between fat, muscle, tumor, bone. And that's how we generate images for diagnostic use. Could we try this out? Maybe we can put an item inside the machine and take some pictures? Yeah, let's do it. So this is Jamie. Jamie also has a lot of water because Jamie is a pineapple. Um, but we're gonna see what happens when we put Jamie in the magnet. All right, so we're gonna bring Jamie in for the scan. And we're gonna get Jamie set up in the coil for a good signal. And we're gonna make sure Jamie has a squeeze ball just in case we need to stop the scan. And we're gonna send Jamie in. You okay, Jamie? This is actually the first time I've scanned a pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> How does the time affect things? Are you using different scannings, and so some take longer than others? Yeah, this is a T1 weighted sequence, so it's relying on getting contrast from how quickly the protons in the pineapple are relaxing back to being aligned with the main axis of the magnet. This is the very core set of images that are used to initially just figure out where the pineapple's positioned in the scanner. Then we went through, and after we did the scout and localized our pineapple, we took some sagittal images. And we took our time, so we spent more time imaging, and we got images of much better signals. So here you can really see the detail of the grooves in the pineapple rind. This is actually a T2 weighted scan. So um, what's brightest are the portions of the pineapple that have the most movable water. And that's why the core of the pineapple is so dark here. Right. Because the core of a pineapple is dense. Um, it's not really the juiciest part of the pineapple. Right. So the juiciest parts of the pineapple that you think about when you bite into a slice of the pineapple are here in sort of the ring around, right? 
So that's why on a Chi Chi weighted sequence, we have these very bright regions right. for the juiciest parts. And then the blueberries are very juicy. So those are actually brighter compared to the core of the pineapple. It still has a swirliness to it, right? That yeah. is interesting. Yeah. So this is the Chi Chi weighted sequence. And then here, this is the proton density weighted sequence. And so this is purely, it has a very short echo time and still a long repetition time. So it's giving, it's both allowing the protons sufficient time to relax to being realigned with the main magnetic field before the next, before the next radio frequency pulse tips the spins away. And at the same time, it's performing a very fast image before the protons have a chance to really finish relaxing, to finish decaying signal. Hopefully now you see how the four main topics of physics 317L, electricity, magnetism, electromagnetic waves, and nuclear physics all go into making an MRI machine work. It's a wonderful example of how you can use physics to solve real world problems. In this specific case, biomedical research and medical diagnostics. One way to think about physics in general is that it's a field trying to understand the fundamental principles of how the universe works. How does everything work at a very fundamental level? Maxwell's equations are a good way to write down some of that understanding, specifically to deal with electromagnetism. So the question becomes, what do you do with that knowledge? Specifically you, what would you do with that knowledge? Maybe there's a problem that you're interested in that you think is important that you can help solve using physics.